In 1943, one-time bootlegger Joe Saltis sat in a tavern at 7089 South Chicago Avenue and became annoyed with a steelworker named Jasper Garitano because Garitano was strumming his guitar. At closing time, 4 a.m., Saltis waited outside the tavern for Garitano, who wasn't aware that he had done anything wrong. Garitano and two C-0 workers left the bar and walked straight into Saltis, who was holding a gun on them. The steel workers didn't waste time, one tackled Saltis by the knees and the third landed a couple of well-placed punches. The gun went off twice and then got thrown across the street. Michael Congelis, another steel worker, stepped out of the bar holding the guitar, which was his and not Garitano's. Seeing his friends fight it out with Saltis, Congelis took the guitar and broke it over Saltis's head. The bar owner came out to the street and yelled, Hey! Don't you guys know that's Joe Saltis you're beating up? The steel workers piled into a car and left the scene, leaving Saltis sprawled out on the sidewalk. Passersby took him to the hospital where he was given nine stitches on his scalp. Police traced the license plate number of the steel worker's car and brought Congelese, who owned the car, Garitano, Joseph de Bartolo, and Michael Santoro into the station. When they explained themselves, Saltis was taken from the hospital and charged with assault with intent to kill. He spent the night in the can. He gave his age as 55 and said he lived at the Park Manor Hotel, 7086 South Chicago Avenue. Lieutenant Johnson asked Saltis what had happened to his head. I don't know, he said. I might have fallen down. That was in 1943. By 1947, Saltis, who was only 55 years old, or possibly 52, was dead of what the hospital said was a liver issue. In other words, he drank himself to death, but the official cause of death was an untreated stomach ulcer. Age was the issue. Saltis told nurses at the hospital where he died that he was 62 years old. He was born in Budapest, then part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, so his actual age was never confirmed. He arrived in the U.S. when he was about 11 years old and was brought to Chicago by his widowed mother. Still, just a child, Saltis was forced to go to work in the stockyards as a cattle hand at 10 cents an hour. Prohibition made him rich. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, he built a fortune of at least $3 million, about $54 million in today's value. At his height, he owned three breweries and gave $50 tips to cigarette girls and pianos for his girlfriends. In 1931, Saltis was named one of 26 public enemies and was labeled a vagrant because he refused to give the police or the courts his address. In court, Saltis produced a novel defense in the form of two reels of motion pictures of himself. Over his objections, he wasn't permitted to screen the movie in court. The judge and the prosecution ran the strips of gelatin between their fingers and with the aid of magnifying glasses watched the Saltis film production made on his Wisconsin estate. There were several hundred feet of film depicting Saltis wielding an axe and chopping down trees, riding a horse, and welcoming guests to his mountain resort. A letter attached to the film read Joe Saltis' educational picture, directed from real life by Joe Saltis and to be shown in Judge Justin. F. McCarthy's courtroom when the judge says okay. At the end of the hearing, Saltis passed around advanced publicity flyers on his film, which read Joe Saltis ain't so vague. He's no vague, no sir, there is not a man in Wisconsin who works harder than I do. True enough, I used to hustle a little beer in the old days, but that's all down the river. I've been a respectable innkeeper for three years. But he died broke. All the money he had in the world was found in his pant pocket, about $165. When the police found him on the streets and asked him his name, he said, I'm Joe Saltis. I'm the beer baron. In his last hours, failed to recognize his wife, Anna, and son, Joseph Jr. Anna left Saltis in 1933 and sued him for divorce three times, but Saltis managed to put off the final divorce until he died. When Prohibition ended, Saltis was still wealthy, but he had put his property in his wife's name to avoid taxes. When they separated, she refused to give up their $50,000 home at 9859 South Bell Avenue and other considerable other holdings. 
Anna, whose maiden name was Lucas, testified in court that a drunken Saltus held a loaded pistol he carried constantly in his hip pocket to her forehead seven times during their marriage. She said that in March of 1939, Saltus went on a drunken spree, wrecking several clocks and a set of dishes in their home, and then stormed out returning at 3 a.m. I was in our bedroom, she said, holding my three-week-old grandson in my arms. Joe was drunk. He came up the stairs and pulled the revolver out of his pocket. He held it to my forehead like he had done before. I screamed. The screams, she testified, brought her son Edward running to the scene. Saltus knocked him down and yelled that he was going to blow up the house. Mrs. Saltus packed up and took her family to a relative's home. She went on to say that he was far from an open-handed, generous husband as he had described to the courts. He carried around, she said, five or ten thousand dollars in his pockets and bought pianos for girlfriends, but I had a hard time to get living expenses. He was a good husband in the old days before he got in the money. He worked in a bolt factory, and we kept boarders. Joe was a good man then. In 1941, Saltus was arrested after he fired a shotgun blast into the car Anna and their son Joe Jr. was riding in. Saltus had gotten drunk and wanted to take Anna's car out to go someplace. She refused to give him the keys. She and Joe Jr. got in the car and were pulling out of the garage when Saltus fired a round of buckshot into the car. After that, Saltus filed a court petition claiming that only one of his three sons, Emil, was his. Joseph Jr. and Edward, he implied, were fathered by another man while Anna was married to him. In the hospital where he died, Saltus said that his address was 35 North Clark Street, which had been the address of his girlfriend Nellie Long. It was Long who had Saltus arrested in January of 1946, charging he held out $300 of $5,000 she had given him for safekeeping and threatened her by telephone. Saltus was acquitted in the case. Saltus' brother John, Big John Saltus, was involved in the rackets for the first part of his life. In 1930, John, who had a long scar across his face similar to Capone's, was arrested while carrying a car full of bootleg whiskey. The judge in the case ordered that the car, John's personal belonging, be ceased and sold. On the day of the hearing to determine what would become of the car, John's lawyer George Crane entered the federal court with one eye closed, swollen and red. When the judge asked what happened to his eye, Crane replied, my baby stuck his finger in it. The case was postponed, but eventually the car was forfeited. In 1939, John, who was on the payroll of the Amalgamated Meat Cutters and Butcher Workmen of America, was yanked before a congressional hearing looking into corrupt labor union practices. John Saltis died in Chicago in 1970 at age 77. Brother Stephen, who also waltzed in and out of the rackets, died in 1969 in Evergreen Park, Illinois.